All right, someone play Wipeout in the background. Alexa. <laughs> Alexa, play Wipeout. <laughs> Alexa, play Despacito. <laughs> Welcome to Casuals of Runeterra, episode 38. I'm your host, Ryan, here with your other host, Hetch. And the deserts of Shurima are still as vast as ever. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're wandering through. You know, it's funny. I thought I didn't really think about it until we got to this point in the lore. But there's a lot of... <laughs> shifting timelines <laughs> oh my god we're not um, even that's at not, that no, that's point not, <laughs> how could you not, do this to me <laughs> that's not what i was going for but you know you have a lot of people moving in and out of the main parts of shirima and every time they come back it's usually stated that they have to search for things right because it is constantly shifting so things aren't always where they used to be because so many of the natives are nomads, they're not always in the same locations. So I could see how there's this constant adventure of trying to find everyone uh, and find your path. It's like, oh, I heard this thing happened, but I don't know where it's at. So yeah, now I, I have to look for it. Strictly off of a lore comment, yes, yes, the the, the desert of Shurima is vast <laughs> and ever changing. This is true, but you know that's that doesn't make good meme content. <laughs> True, true. But always up top, uh, we're back. Housekeeping up top. You can listen to us everywhere as always. Uh, follow us on Twitter. It's a great way to keep up to date on episodes. That's at Podcast Core. That's C-O-R. And you can send an email to the same name at gmail.com. And please leave a like, follow, and short review. And tell a friend to go on an adventure and listen to the Casuals of Runeterra podcast. Okay, okay. This is why you hit me with it. Because you didn't have a cheese line. You were actually a uh-huh. good person this uh-huh. week. And then uh-huh. you just ran ruined it for me. Yeah, I had to give you some cheese, right? Uh, man, I, I hate it here. <laughs> <laughs> state of the game, state of the game. State of the game. What do you yeah, find? So I, I finally swapped, and I sort of swapped. I now have... Ooh. So what I've been trying to do is get into the state of... I'm trying to play more competitively again uh, and more focused and try to grow uh, because I've been just playing in between here and there, and now I have a little bit more time, which is fun. So I'm trying to have the whole three deck structure. You know, a lot of tournaments now are three deck based. So I want to play in that format to get comfortable with three decks that I like to play in my play style. Um, they're all from Jory. I'm officially a Jory fanboy. I don't know if he knows. Uh, <laughs> Man, anyone listening to our podcast knew you were a Jory fanboy before you did, because I'm pretty <laughs> sure at this point we've got five episodes of you just being like, Jory, <laughs> yeah. Jory Senpai, please notice me. <laughs> True. His play style is so much like mine. So I'm playing one of two new decks he put out that he's been playing at Masters. And one of them is, I'm talking about this episode, is Spiders with Draven. So it's basically Spiders has seen a resurgence now uh, because there's the meta's not stale, but it is very dominated um, by TF Fizz. So Spiders is a great deck to kind of check um, those type of decks to make sure that they have to hit their drops because Spiders will overrun you if your deck piddles out. Um, so I'm playing... That deck with the twist of the new spider that came out with the set, which is the two point or two, the two attack five health spider that gives when it attack it grants all spiders in play. Yeah, uh, yeah. Plus one, I, plus zero. Oh lord, what, what, what was that spider? Continue, continue. Yeah, I'm and sorry. then obviously Draven Specialist uh, is kind of my goal here. <laughs> so Draven is in literally all of my decks. Uh, this man's trying to get like those uh, your MP on your <laughs> on yeah. your Draven portrait. Yeah, it's like, I a, need I need people to know. Yeah, Draven's a really good solid card. But yeah, so I'm finally playing something different. I'm getting used to it. Uh, still grinding up the ladder from the reset. I'm in like gold four now. So just heading back to platinum is the is the plan, and seeing if I can get the old diamond and hang out there for a bit uh, before the set switches. Just I, I need more time. Need more time. Oh, I always need more time. And it's Shrieking Spinner. Yeah, Shrieking Spinner. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I had to look that one up because it's like, oh, God. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of came out under the radar because no one was playing Spiders. I mean, uh, not to mention that this is the first change that Spiders have really gotten since, like, beta, really. Mm-hmm. We, like, 
the spiders is such an established deck that it's like it's like the scriptures of room terra you know the spider cards and it has never changed except now it has so that's exactly if you like spiders go listen to our lease episode one of the yeah. early bangers and and I, god i took the spiders for granted so much because yeah. then like i it wasn't it was watching um i think it was watching mogwai and he was trying to climb with spiders and it's like okay here's tf is and i'm like yeah red card poops on this and it's like all right <laughs> all right card games work off of variants duh you know what is i don't, I don't deserve i don't deserve <laughs> this podcast <laughs> so what are you playing right now besides uh, scouts uh, uh, how dare you say that to me <laughs> so scouts um but no no i i have switched it up um mm -hmm. i've been having a ton of fun because uh the thing that i've been waiting to do is and I waited until I finished up the event pass to get all of the cards that came with it for free to save my yeah, shards. Congrats on that. The Thanks. madman did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got my Azir cosmetic, make it look like nice. I'm official. Yeah, yeah. What's up? What's up? You know, brush <laughs> brush my shoulders off. But I My dad been, owns a dealership. I have been <laughs> playing around with uh Sharima deck only. I am restoring the sun disc, baby. Oh, um, solo sharima yes uh right now the list that i have been playing with is still mostly a, a focus on the predict cards mm -hmm. because predict is just good yeah um not to mention that even if you're not doing all of the predict cards just being able to tutor the top of your deck whenever you have the opportunity combined with the three drop kahiri mm -hmm. Uh, getting a three mana four four on curve is usually just always a good place to be yeah and as someone who is a degenerate demacia player i am very happy to have my my bear back in his full glory in the yeah. form of a three mana four four um but i have switched it up a, a bit to do a lot more vulnerable and renekton okay. because the, the neck boy is angry neck and boy is angry and I talked about it when we were did our Renekton episode. So you can hear me gush about it there if you want, yeah. which was the dream of getting the restored sun disc. Yeah. And having a 10-10 fearsome trample <laughs> on, for four mana. Like, yes, I will I will sell my soul to try to get this to happen. <laughs> so that, that's what I've been doing. Sell your soul for the right cause. Them's the rules. Them's, Them's the, the rules. rules. So this takes us into our topic of today. Uh, which maybe we kept a little bit of a secret this time. Usually we give away the game immediately because we're so excited. <laughs> but sand surfing with Talia. All right, someone play Wipeout in the background. Alexa. <laughs> Alexa, play Wipeout. <laughs> Alexa, play Despacito. <laughs> Uh, so we're gonna start with our spell today, as always, as we do every day, try to take over the world. Um, and the spell is a good one. Uh, this was a shocker when they revealed it, and I was immediately like, oh no, this is gonna be a problem. Uh, Shaped Stone. So Shaped Stone is a one cost burst spell, uh, so it doesn't fit into our broken category. <laughs> if you know what that the, the is. The mana cost is too good. It's too, can't mana be cost too low. Too low. <laughs> uh, and Shaped Stone has give an ally plus one plus one this round. So it's already solid. If you've summoned a landmark, so one landmark, this game, give it plus three plus one instead. So, yeah. Uh, and big spoilers uh, Sharima has landmarks. Yeah. Yeah. Sharima is a landmark set, as, as we've talked about in the previous episode. Just a couple. Just a couple. And this card already on its own is good. The cost is great. Um, but it fits really well into the archetype that will be played in. And it can be played in multiple archetypes as long as there's, you know, landmarks, at least a couple. Uh, because that base, the base is so good that the the extra is just extra icing on the cake. Um, so for the decks that Sharima plays, like Hesh just talked about his solo Sharima deck, they're very aggro they're meant to get moment is momentum and attrition, right? So these are the type of cards that help you get attrition uh, with these combat tricks, and they are always gonna have to play around it, uh, regardless if you have it or not. So that's what makes this card so strong. Yeah. Not not to mention that because obviously there is a you know there's a potential of this bricking where you don't have the landmark. 
if it bricks, it's a radiant strike. <laughs> it's it it's bricked form is already a good card yeah like no, i mean not like a game breaking card but a good card like yeah. like okay yeah sure oh no I, I missed the attack oh well plus one plus one eat your heart out <laughs> and then you know you obviously have the lore implications here uh from talia we got a quote on this card for her which is with the land's help we will defend ourselves uh exclamation point so <laughs> will all caps. Yes, the feisty uh, willpower that is within her uh, is made of stone. So that's a good one. And this takes us to our follower, which is Rockhopper. So Rockhopper is another card that kind of fits into this archetype, which Sharima is definitely obviously you know uh, the region has its focus, but all the cards work really well together. Uh, and I know that's probably redundant in saying that. Uh, but once again, this card fits into that aggro strategy. It's a solid aggro card. So it's a two cost three, one with when I'm summoned, summon a rolling sands. And what rolling sands is, is the landmark that automatically spawns on the board. And it has when an enemy is summoned, destroy me to grant it vulnerable. And that allows you to be aggressive, has a good stat line for trading, uh, trading up and then the landmark helps you control tempo because whatever they play next, they have to be willing to give you control over it during battle on your turn. Uh, so that's always, always yeah, a the, great. The, the vulnerable there. that comes with that Roiling Sands like can really, really mess up a lot of decks. And again, like it, one of the reasons that Cease Play is because of decks like TF Fizz because of the fact that like those decks want to be hitting TF on curve. You play this on to turn four into their four mana, and it's like, okay, you you either give the vulnerable to TF or I'm messing up your card for the game. And it's it, it, it's it's good. It's good. Yeah. Um, and then the cool thing about this card, so there's a couple set there's a set of cards, you know, in, in other episodes we'll talk about cards that we don't get to in the main lore episodes, but there's a theme across about four or five cards with a group of friends, a group of teens, where they have these journal entries as they're going on this adventure around Sharima. Because as we talked about uh, in the past, you have a lot of nomad tribes. Uh, so kids get to have fun, right? The whole the yeah. whole, the whole region is their playground, yeah. uh, literally. And, and, and this is one of my favorites because you know what? Like, yeah, I like Sammy. You I like to read it? Go ahead and read it. Oh, yeah. So... Um, so the journal entry on Rock Hopper is, Today we began our journey to Nashrame. Samir is determined to cross the Great Sai before the next full moon and is making such a mess of things. I did not know a simple sandboard could collapse a whole dune. <laughs> and neither did Sammy. <laughs> he's fine. Sam, Sammy comes up a lot in the in the he's he's the he's the boy who definitely takes the risk and gets on everyone's nerves. Yeah, I, I like Sammy. I like Sammy. I think I think Sammy and I could hang out and have fun. <laughs> so this takes us to our landmark. So this is something we're adding as a little you know side section here because landmarks aren't spells and they aren't followers. They can create spells or followers, but they they're kind of an in between that we've we've now gotten so much of in Sharima that they deserve their own spot. So why not, right? Yeah, and, and like like I said before, Sharima has landmarks. Like just you know maybe just a couple they have landmarks so if if you're fine with us you know adding in the third slot breaking our format let us know like because yeah. uh if this ruins we, the listening experience and you have to delete the podcast let us know <laughs> let us know first <laughs> just, you know like communicate yeah so the first one that was revealed uh early on in the set reveal uh, that obviously grabbed everybody's attention is probably one of the more playable ones is hibernating rock bear so this is just a solid effect right it introduced yeah. it came along with the con countdown concept um, which people will know as suspend from magic and what this card does is it's a two costed landmark that has a countdown of three so when you play it the first countdown is that turn uh, you need three of those and then it summons a grumpy rock bear and a grumpy rock bear is a five cost five four and one thing to note is flavor wise, we have all the teens in this uh, in this image as well as the rock bear wakes up because this is just another stop on their adventure is to bug the sleeping hardworking bear. <laughs> so 
Yeah. I, like, even if you don't, like, look into the journal entries and the flavor text on the cards, everybody kind of has an idea of how this goes just from the voice lines within the game of like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to be what woke you up. <laughs> Um, but Grumpy Rock Bear is kind of a cool concept because, you know, it's pay now, power later, right? So you're paying that too to get out early. And the benefit of power later is that that mana that you get, the efficiency of that five costed five four, your opponent has to interact with you at some point, right? They either have to interact with the landmark or they interact with the creature at some point. And in that time frame, you get the space to have uh, leave up reaction mana, right? You can bank mana, spell mana, just have mana up so that you can make that even more difficult. And that's the point where you essentially get some tempo back. So you're giving up a bit of tempo for a lot of tempo in the late game based on how this ar archetype plays out. Yeah, and not not to mention that like it'll, it hasn't been optimized yet, or if it has, I'm at too much of a plebe tier to really see it. Uh, but the <coughs> with Sharima, there is a lot of risk of Sharima players getting a ton of value off of cards like this. Um, like with cards like Talia, which we'll get into later, but you know, some cards that we're, you know, we haven't really talked about on the show, which like promising future, which, you know, doubles a countdown trigger or uh, for magic players, a suspend trigger. Mm -hmm. Like it, like there is, there's a lot of ways that Sharima can get value off of these investments. So it, it just plays such a risk that like you always kind of have in the back of your mind of like, Okay, is this guy a degenerate? Is he is he going for it? He's going for it. <laughs> That's usually how it feels. Oh boy, he's going for it. Uh, but go ahead and take us into the topic. All right, so uh, Talia, our, our this is our version of Toff. So eat your heart out, Atla yeah. fans. Like you know, we we got our own Toff. Um, it I, happened. It finally this happened. This is it. This is it. This podcast is about declaring war on the Atla or, fan base. And, and <laughs> obviously, you know, it's Talia or Talia. I do, it, which one do you think would fit Sharima, like Shariman uh, pronunciation? It, so so whenever I don't know things, I always default into, like, saying it in Spanish in my head. Okay. Um. So which would be Talia. Okay. Or okay. it would be Talia. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but who knows? Who knows? I, I think we'll Talia. Talia. Yeah. No, no, Talia? I'm fine with Talia. I'm okay. fine with Talia. Like, I think, I think that one just kind of fits the American tongue better. Yeah. And I know I go back and forth constantly because I, my, I get confused in my brain and I don't know what I'm trying to say. And then I speak gibberish. So yeah, I tend to go with the hard sounds for Sharima because you have Renekton, you have Nasus, you have Azir, you have Zareth. Like, so I'm like, okay, that fits it when you when you look at it that way. Yeah, but as yeah. you were. All right. All right. All right. Yeah. Let us know. <laughs> like, like, tell us how to say it because we don't know anymore. No, we commit. All right. So, <laughs> all right. So, Talia is, uh, we're going to go obviously from kind of the beginning with her story since she is so young, but she is born to a group of nomads. So, to a nomadic tribe of the Sharima Deserts. And there, she's born kind of bordering the Akathia border. So, Acathia is not something that we're that we're gonna have a chance to talk about on this show too much. Um, it is a region in Rune Terra, and um, back when Sharima was getting teased, I kind of started. Uh, I started kind of trying to hint. It's like, oh, maybe they're gonna give us a uh, uh, Rengar so that we get Acathia coming up next. Uh, but uh, it. That's not the region we're talking about, but that is what Akathia is. All right, so just to give you a little bit of context there. So this nomadic tribe, they kind of stay near that border, and it's a tribe that their main uh, export is goats. So Talia's parents specifically is a goat herder and her father, and her mother is a weaver. So uh, from a very young age, Talia is growing up in an environment that's constantly on the move and she's always outside in the desert tending to the goats with her father. So even when she was a toddler, she is helping out with the goats, but she's always been attracted to the earth around her where a lot of people just see beige. She sees a whole myriad of colors that is hidden beneath the sands within the earth. 
Um, so after her six high summer, so we're going to say when she's around six, because I don't know how the Shariman calendar works. <laughs> so when she's about six years old, Talia ends up walking or kind of uh, walking away, wandering away from the nomads, from the tribe, because she's in search of a baby goat that got away from the herd. And when she finds the goat, it's kind of precariously put on a cliffside and it's gotten itself stuck. It's, uh, it has climbed and it can't get down. <laughs> Please, please which don't... happens actually more often than not when you look at mountain goats yeah that, that's a real thing when you're looking at goats. yeah there's if you want to if you want to indulge uh listeners go just look up uh mountain goats stuck on the side of like sheer mountains because like literally looks like they're laying against the mountain because you don't know how they got up there <laughs> and, and, and they also look like they're they don't have four legs anymore they look like they're flat yeah, yeah. it's like what painted the on the rock heck what am i looking at <laughs> um so yeah, so she finds the baby goat kind of precariously set up like that, and this is when the magic of the earth calls to her, and she ends up putting her hand on this sheer cliff face and answering the call that of the earth that is just reaching out to her, and this is how Talia discovers that she has the power of earth weaving, um, and all that any one of the tribe knows is that her father, going late into the evening, worried because Talia hasn't returned, finds Talia with this destroyed cliff face around her, and she is buried under loose rocks and sand. And yeah, so but not crushed. It's just like yeah, she's debris. buried. And one of the one of the ways that like it. To picture this in your mind is like because obviously like your brain kind of goes to like a disaster uh, scenario, but the buried that she's under is like someone made a blanket of earth and tucked her in. <laughs> uh, so weird, but Talia is fine, but she is running a fever, um, and it, we do we do get a, into a little fire bit mage into that. confirmed. Yeah, like uh, <laughs> called Demacia, <laughs> the Talia hunt begins. Um, and with Demacia, like if you with the Lux episode, like that whole idea of running a fever and like your mm -hmm. body adapting to these yep. powers, we talk about that. But um, Ooh, the callback, listen to the Lux episode. Hey, <laughs> we didn't talk about that super early because Hetch has a problem. Um, <laughs> the first episode. I know what I like. I know what I like. <laughs> um, so, so obviously, Talia gets taken back to the tribe, and they take her to um, what they call the the village grandmother, which I'm assuming is the wise, wise woman, and it's one of the only other characters of this story that's named in Babajan, um, and Babajan is telling the family that you know she is yes she's running a fever, but she's fine. She was protected by the great weaver. So it's a combination of this whole new discovery of what she's capable of doing and the, you know, the village elder, the wise woman, in essence, uh, assuming that Talia didn't do this, that sets in Talia's mind of this is dangerous and I shouldn't let anyone know I can do this. So Talia ends up living her life, hiding her powers away from the tribe. And for most of her childhood, this is kind of how she lives. This is a status quo of her hiding her ability to stone weave away from everyone until she comes of age to take part in the in the ceremony that this tribe goes under, which is like a great dance to the great weaver. Um, so what the children of this tribe do when they come of age is that they gather up tools and art tools and artifacts but you know essentially just um uh items of importance to themselves and they perform a dance in front of the whole tribe revealing the revealing the gifts that they have and what they bring to the table of the tribe and it is at this ceremony at the end of the dance that someone steps up and becomes the, the the mentor to this young adult 
to teach them their craft. And this is how like all the crafts go on throughout this tribe. Talia, her, yes, she knows how to weave because of her mom and she's a great shepherd. That ain't her gift. Uh, yeah. Her gift. Her gift's a little different, and it is during this because obviously there's a bit of you know a, a kind of ritual to it, and so they do take a spiritual um, feeling with it because it goes to the great weave. So Talia kind of loses herself in this in this dance at her coming of age. And she ends up stone weaving in front of the entire tribe. Do you imagine uh, in the background, as this dance is happening, the beautiful animation that we get from Riot and Eminem's Lose Yourself plays in the background as, <laughs> as her powers <laughs> reveal no, themselves? Not Eminem's. <laughs> 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 oh, no. Mom's spaghetti indeed. Oh, okay. So yeah, that's the canon now. Riot, give us the animation. Uh, if you don't, go ahead and get the rights to Eminem's "Lose Yourself." Uh, we will find you. Oh man! All right. So it is at this ceremony that Talia, you know, she ends up stone weaving. But what she does is like, imagine, imagine these gigantic boulders. In these rocks, or the the animation from Runeterra of like these spears of rocks just coming out of the ground and kind of moving around her like ribbons, like doing a gymnat like a gymnastic routine, except with you know giant rocks that could crush everyone around her. Uh, So yeah, a lot of people were taken aback by it, and Talia realizes what she's doing, so she panics. And she lets go of the magic in this panic of like, oh, crap, I wasn't supposed to do that. And her mom is like, oh, no, my baby's going to get crushed. And no one gets hurt except we get this anime scene of like, you know, the little tiny scratch on mom's cheek of like, oh, no. One one thing to note as well for anyone who hasn't listened to the other Shreema episodes, which you should at this point, but... Remember, Rune Nation 2.0 happened. So when you have these, when you have these moments, these grandiose moments of possible destructive power, people tend to be like, okay, wait, hold up. <laughs> let's let's get a grasp on the situation so we don't have, you know, 3.0 hit too early. You don't want that patch coming too, too hot on the heels of keep, the previous one. Keep listening and figure out if this is Rune Nation 3.0. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So yeah, people, people at this point, especially like, yeah, we're 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 watching. We know we know better than to just let this happen. Um, but yes, so her mom gets a little bit of a scratch on her cheek, and Talia ends up just running away because it's like, oh no, like I I knew it, I knew it. This these powers were bad, and it's I I I have to keep everything under wraps. I shouldn't have done this. And her father ends up tracking her down, and they have a heart-to-heart as far as Talia revealing the powers that she's capable of. And her father, like, look, you know, this is who you are, and the only thing that you can do is to be yourself. And that is the heartwarming lesson, and it's the last heartwarming thing we ever get in Runeterra. Yeah. That's, just, that's just how the lore goes. <laughs> um, like, heartwarming doesn't make a good story all the time, but... Uh, you know, so she's she gets that encouragement from her father. She returns to the tribe and completes her ceremony of coming of age. And obviously, this is a power that no one has seen in generations. So there's no one that can be able to train her, but there's a beautiful symbolic moment of the entire tribe standing to be her mentor. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's this sense of like, okay, like, you know, we support you. We can't help you, but we support you. I'm only a builder, but I'll help her. <laughs> and you have my sword. And you have my sword. <laughs> and my axe. Um, <laughs> so Talia, she takes this encouragement and she goes on actually leaving the tribe this an time. An adventure. Like, and it's, it's about to get serious. <laughs> and now she's on an adventure to find herself a mentor. And mm-hmm. no, it can't get that serious, Ryan, it can't get that serious. So she finds her first group of people to lead her to a mentor, and it's a Noxian 
regiment moving into the deserts. Okay, never mind. Yeah, it gets that serious right so, off the bat. Wait, <laughs> so we have a disclaimer here. Since we haven't gotten to the Noxus region in any significant matter, and we know we probably got some hate for it, uh, there's a lot there. <laughs> we're, start, like, we're, we're, <laughs> we're starting to get forced to get there. We'll get there in due time. Um, one thing to note, though, is that she's going towards Targan. She's pulled towards Targan because Targan is a mountain right it's this mystical yes. thing yeah which is being pulled to but then there's a little like dangling you know bell in the distance and it's a noxian noxian uh yeah. war group and or a uh, contingency it's like hey no come hang out with us we yes. smoke cigarettes yes and and of course she's heading towards <laughs> targon because the only teacher that she can think of is the earth that's calling to her and there is no place more magical in the earth than Targon. Yeah. But but yeah, and she runs into a Noxian regiment on the way. And it's a a Noxian regiment is obviously, you know, a, a military group, but the Noxians are like, no, like we are all over Runeterra and we value the study of magic. So yeah, if you come with us of sorts. if you if you come with us, we will be able to find you a teacher. Mm -hmm. And Talia, this is the best offer she's ever gotten, and it happened so soon. It's like, okay, yeah. And she's still young. Keep that in mind as well. Yeah, she's still young, and not to mention that, you know, growing up in the same, in the tribe, like, constantly on the move, like, all you have is to trust people. So she ends up going to Noxus, and here's the big spoiler of this story, is that she's not really into the idea of politics, watching every detail of words being spoken, and a military uh, nation. So yeah. this is going to go okay. Uh, so the meritocracy, good. Military driven, oh no. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh boy. Um, so it is with within Noxus that she's constantly being moved between different courts. So going from noble house to noble house, because at this point, the the regiment that brought her back is kind of parading her of like, hey, check out the talent that we found um, with under the guise of, yes, we'll find you a teacher. But really all they're doing is trying to get funding from a noble house so that they could go back out on the campaign to obtain glory for Noxus. Um, is this when we finally end up going to Noxus? Is this our connection? Stay tuned to find out. The answer is um, no. But the, <laughs> the, the thing is, stop enticing them. <laughs> All right, we can't. We we give it and we can take it away. <laughs> uh, I'm deceased. <laughs> Um, so it is it is within these noble houses and getting passed around that Talia does end up kind of sticking herself to a teacher. And what she stuck herself to is to someone uh, who is a Navy captain. And the promise that he has is like, look, I can't teach you how to use your magic, but my ship is called Across the Seas. And it is in this new land that we are conquering that you will find a teacher because everyone there has connections to the world of magic that that you have connections to. Obviously, he has no idea what he's talking about, but it's like, OK, this is you seem all right. Like this seems on the up and up because you're at least you're the first person honest with me. Yeah. Uh, you're telling me that you can't teach me, but you can find me a teacher. So I'll go with you. So she hops on the ship and they sail to Ionia. Huh? It's weird now, how they keep ending up there. Like it's Poland. And you know, like if, <laughs> you know, we got a, we got a couple episodes with Ionia and, um, the, our only Noxus episode with Riven. Um, <laughs> And Noxus and Ionia, they get they get along. So fast forward to the end of this to the end of this boat journey, and standing on the ship, looking at the shores, there's a battle going on because the fleet that this captain is sailing with, you know, is landing on a beachhead and immediately just fighting. She's just seeing, you know, all the fighting on the beach. She sees a village in the distance. They're sailing before the sun has even risen. This is when they're landing. And the captain's like, you see that village? 
drop the earth on it while they sleep drop the earth on it or you're off my ship <laughs> obviously this is not what talia signed up for quick aside the ionian <laughs> sea is just as bad as the sea by bill's water <laughs> Because Ionia has creatures in the sky and in the water. <laughs> it's not a place yeah. you want to be. Like, if we want to talk about the real unsung heroes of the world of Runeterra, it's the sailors. Because yeah. it does not matter where you're sailing. You're just screwed. If you're yeah. on a boat, you're <laughs> absolutely screwed. And because, like, even if it's like, oh, Vreljord, your boat might make it out. Yeah. It might freeze in place. Who knows? We don't know. Like, you're screwed if you're on a boat. So the unsung heroes. Uh, and so Talia is looking at, you know, these at these huts. And, you know, she grew up in a village. So she's aware. It's like, I don't even see fire smokes from fires. Like, these are people that are asleep. And Talia's like, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not dropping the earth. So she gets escorted off the boat. And by escorted off the boat... She gets grabbed and chucked like like a bag of potatoes just <laughs> tossed overboard. So, okay, now the, here's – we made jokes earlier about what cinematic we want. This is a real request, Riot. I need okay. the cinematic of, like, the Saving Private Ryan cinematic <laughs> of Talia getting tossed off this boat and making her way to shore – through the war that is happening on the beachhead <laughs> and away from the comp this is what i need okay I, matt, like, matt damon holding an ionian soldier in his arm screaming <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> make it so right oh uh, okay so yeah so Talia does make it through the beachhead yeah. out of the conflict, and it is with her wandering and the continuation of her journey into Ionia that she does actually find her teacher. And we hinted at this in a previous episode, and that previous episode is she finds Yasuo. Mm -hmm. Now, Yasuo, yes, he's a swordsman, but he has control over the element of wind. Yep. And now we've got our connection to the last airbender right here. You know, it's the, except this time it's the airbender teaching the earthbender mm -hmm. how to use their powers. But she does find a kindred spirit in Yasuo because this is at a point like towards the end of what we know of Yasuo's story or the initial story where he's already you know, blamed for killing his teacher. He's been exiled by his people and he's already come into conflict with his brother Yone. He is fully aware of how dangerous elemental magic can be. And he's fully aware of the control that a, that a magic user needs for the environment around him. So, and he's also a nomad at this point, which that's how she grew up. Yeah, so they they find kindred spirits in each other with Talia being a nomad and used to being on the move, and and Yasuo having already gone through the through grief and through the struggles of coming to learn his own magic when able to teach each other. So this is the teacher that Talia finds, and they go on adventures together. I cannot wait for the day that we can start breaking down those adventures. Yeah, but. We're gonna we're gonna fast forward a little bit here, which is Talia returning to Sharima. And this is a big spoiler for how all of the other Sharima episodes that we had. This is how this is how the world views the return of the ascended. Okay. So Talia is returning to Sharima because she starts hearing rumors through different merchants and traders that a new kingdom is arising in Sharima. It's a return of some god emperor, of some ancient being that has been awoken, and they've come back to enslave all of the peoples of Sharima. Mm -hmm. So they're received well. <laughs> uh, and, and Talia's like, okay, well, I got to go back home, and I got to go help my people. And this is kind of where her story ends. It ends yeah. with her saying goodbye to Yasuo, thanks 
so long and she returns to Sharima, but now she has the skill, um, the skill and understanding of her magic that she didn't have before and an in rock hard will to push through whatever comes her way. And it is definitely going to be unstoppable force meets immovable object in her yeah. eyes. And, and there's, there's she has the power to move it. Yeah, there's there's two points here, important points. One, so be, a reference back to what I said earlier in the episode, where it's an ever-shifting sands, right? So she's returning after a long period of time, after Azir has returned and everything with that Sharima Capule has rose out of the sand. She's going to have a hard time finding things. <laughs> Everything's not going to be where it's supposed to. You know, uh, it, it's sense. it's one thing of shifting sands to where one dune is going to be completely changed yeah. upon the, you know, the moon cycle. And then the shifting sands. There's a freaking oasis <laughs> and a sun disk. What's this blinding light in the middle of the desert? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so shifting sands, they shifted a lot this time. <laughs> <laughs> and the second thing being, we get the additional note here, because each of these Sharima stories build on each other. We get the additional note that the tribes that we see that she grew up in, these nomad tribes, are descendants of the slaves uh, that were previously enslaved. But there's that one missing part that during Runation 2.0 from our Azir episode, go listen to it, that... He freed all the slaves before the explosion. So when Hetch mentions it's a rumor, it's a rumor based on incomplete knowledge, right? That's yeah. driving wait, her action. Wait, wait, how is it incomplete knowledge? He told everybody at his ascension <laughs> that the slaves were freed. He told everybody and their mama. <laughs> oh, wait. Only real listeners will know that reference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, you know, like this is where Talia's story l leaves off. So where we're we gonna pick up? We're gonna pick up at one of my favorite parts of this, which is the card. All right, this card, so much freaking fun. I I, I talked last week about how I've been playing mm -hmm. a um a, a Talia deck that is like bouncing with the Monastery of Hirana. Um, it's not good, but it's some of the most fun I've had in this in this new set and I didn't think I'd have this much fun with it. This card is a blast. So um, Talia is going to be a five mana, two, four. Uh, so if we just look at those stat lines, this card sucks. Um, <laughs> but this is what makes it fun. So on the play, so when you play this card from hand, summon an exact copy of an allied landmark. Mm -hmm. And obviously when, they, when Riot gave us a teaser, for Talia, the first thing they did was they copied a uh, rock bear. They they copied the hibernating rock bear, and it was like you know you just start seeing like all these five fours just appear out of nothing. Uh, it's like okay, I got to try this at least once. Um, and but even outside of that, there's a lot of fun things to do with the idea of just copying a landmark. And uh, even outside of Sharima, there's a bunch of landmarks that it's like okay, yeah, I'll play with a two of this real quick just just for the fun of it. And one thing you'll see people doing is because, you know, as we talked about with the mana cost of hibernating rock bear, it's a two cost, right? So if you play it on two, by the time Tilly comes out, he's already a bear. So some people are delaying it by a turn. So there's that incentive to delay it so that you play her before that turn that he turns in because it's an exact copy. So when you copy it, you get it with that timer on it which is that one turn timer. Yeah, uh, so, so it really pushes the tempo in your direction. Oh yeah, yeah, cuz it's like okay, I have to be prepared for 154. I now have to be prepared for 254. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Um so that's already fun, but the level up of Talia is that you have summoned 5 plus landmarks, which we've already talked about a 2 mana 3 1 that progresses Talia. So this is not a hard Level up requirement. She progresses so, herself. Yeah, it, it, she progresses herself, and there are bodies that help progress her. It's yeah. ridiculous. So she can flip pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And the flipped form is where this card gets a lot of fun. Because uh, now Talia is a 3-5, still can copy a landmark off the play. and But upon the attack, deal two damage to my blocker. If it's dead or gone, deal two to the enemy nexus instead. If you have a landmark, do this two more times. All right. So if for anyone that's played the game League of Legends, 
uh, this is the the two damage that she's shooting. The animation that they have for it is basically the exact same thing as Talia's Q in League of Legends. And if you have a landmark, that's when you get the that's when you get the Q where that's off of a new spot of land, and it triggers three times. And this this can get this can get damage going really quick and the fact that like if it you block it you're only really blocking three damage because if whatever you block with dies those that two damage still bleeds through like talia can get out of hand really quick which is perfect for the region that she's in because it is a region that wants to you know kind of get tempo really quick and then just overwhelm you you just either through attrition or just through outright power and exactly. this is one way to do it and we get a quote here on her turn on her flip effect which is uh talia left ionia after hearing word of mon- monumental change in her homeland she returned to shirima to find an emperor reborn her people fraught and the Xersai, which is i think the first reference we get uh, to that specific group more active than ever we're assuming that, you know, there's Xersai and there's Xerath. I don't know. We'll just leave that there. Uh, and she had no choice but to grow beyond her years. So once again, still young, um, coming into the situation that she expects to be a war, mainly because she's associating it with the situation that was she was just in, which was a war. Uh, so it's not too far flung for those to be connected. Yeah, Man, man and, uh, you know, because obviously we haven't, truly talked about Zareth. Um, he does appear a lot in the Azir episode because of their stories are hand in hand. Yeah. But could you imagine hearing all those rumors about, hey, these people, you know, these people just want to make us slaves. Um, and then the first group of people that you run into are the Zersai. <laughs> you know, the people that follow a, a, a being of arcane energy that just wishes, <laughs> that wishes to enslave the world. Uh, you know, it might just kind of confirm yeah. some false rumors, and <laughs> everybody and their mama is not there to set it straight. <laughs> it's a lot to take in. Yeah, on one hand, you have elemental mages, and on the other hand, you have elementals. <laughs> and that takes us into our question, like we do for every episode, which I don't think we've done oh, this one already. Uh, which is surprising because I think this is our first case of like an actual mage type character. But what type of elemental magic would you have? We've done like swords and stuff like that. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And yeah, dragons, yeah. but I don't think we ever talked about magery. Okay, okay. Uh, th- this is actually kind of easy for me. I obviously, I put put yeah. a good bit of thought into this. Um, I I I do identify as Latino. Um, we, okay, <laughs> Latino magic. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you know, I, I am of I am of Cuban descent. Uh, people of Latin descent have uh, we have a kind of passionate uh, reaction to everything, um, and our reactions usually tend to be in the extremes, one way or the other. So I think fire. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll I'll say fire. No particular reason. Caliente magic. <laughs> Caliente. <laughs> I quit. <laughs> so I think from my earlier, uh, you know, earlier statements as well, I already have an answer to this. I mean, we both, if you've gotten this par- far into listening to our podcast, you understand how uh, steeped in in uh, fantasy we are. So uh, Maya's ice magic. I've I've always liked it. I've always liked characters that manipulate ice in any way i've always liked ice swords uh it's very flexible in my opinion i hate the cold even though i'm canadian so there's a little bit of mix up there i think there's still a connection like your uh your your heritage as well to yours it it, it always blows my mind because one this does not surprise me at all yeah i can handle cold i just don't like it yeah (laughs) it's like one this doesn't surprise me at all and then two like every time like even when we're having personal conversations and yeah. we get to this sort of like oh yeah you know I like I like ice mages and stuff, then you all you do is give me reasons of why you don't like ice. <laughs> <laughs> it was like oh yeah it's like no 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 like I, I can't wait until we do the Ash episode. Ash is a real queen. Let me tell you about how much I hate Freljord. <laughs> like, what the hell, man? Listen, you're not wrong, and with that. 
<laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll be back soon with the next episode.